Recording in progress.
Hey guys, uh, very excited for the Spring 14 breakout and want to say hello to the people who are joining us through Zoom. Uh, really happy that you are here also. So I get the pleasure of introducing Andrew DeWoody to talk today. Um, Andrew is Marie DeWoody's father and uh, my husband and is, um, is a genetic genetic professor at Purdue University who studies evolutionary biology, but he's also on our scientific advisory board. And so uh, very excited and, and happy that he's speaking with us today. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, just a little backdrop here. So about three weeks ago, my wife, who's been playing a role in organizing this conference, i.e. she's been very stressed, said, hey, you should give a talk uh, on Ring 14. And I said, wait a minute, I work on like quail and eagles and whales and this kind of stuff. No, no, it'll be fine. I said, what do you want me to talk about? And so she starts going off on all this esoteric stuff all over the place. And we went through this for a couple of weeks and I thought to myself, I still don't have any idea what I'm really supposed to talk about. So I think I'm gonna ask her, cause I'm, I'm smart, right? I'm gonna ask her in an email, hey hon, can you like spell out what you want me to really talk about? Which was not a good idea because then she sent me a list of about 143 things that she wanted me to talk about all in 45 minutes. And oh, by the way, make it really interesting. Don't make it boring. So uh, I'm not exactly sure how this is gonna go especially since I asked her again this morning, what do you want me to talk about? She said, oh, whatever you want to talk about. So, <laughs> so I usually work, as Issa said, on um, lots of different kinds of organisms. I don't, I'm not a um, uh, human geneticist. I'm not a physician. Um, and I would encourage everybody to listen to the experts uh, and, and not necessarily to me. But that said, I do speak as a Ring 14 dad and as a conference organizer's husband. Uh, just don't ask me which one is more stressful. So um, I'm gonna talk, this is, I'm gonna skip this. This is just some of the things Issa wanted me to talk about today on the 14th chromosome. And some of you are probably old enough to remember encyclopedias, right? How they used to come in these bound volumes, right? Dusty volumes on the library uh, shelf. And that's a little bit about a, like the genome is arranged where the chromosomes might represent the individual volumes of a set of encyclopedias. And in humans, we've got 23 pairs of chromosomes uh, because you get one set from mom, one set from dad. So uh, typically we have 46 chromosomes in total. Okay. And so you could think about match pairs like shoes, something like that. Okay, this is my sexy slide that, right, reminds you, we all come from uh, sperm, eggs, right? You get one set of chromosomes from each parent and they combine to form a zygote and then development happens. It's probably been a while since high school biology for most people. So just a reminder, I think everybody's familiar with the different systems, right? Digestive system, nervous system, uh, et cetera. And you're familiar with your organs, right? My, whether you have a stomach ache or a headache or anything like that. It's probably been a while since many of you thought about tissues uh, particularly about cells. I am going to talk a little bit about cells because that's where the DNA resides uh, in, you know, the, the nucleus of the cell. And that's represented here by this yellow sphere. And then the, uh, the structures inside the yellow sphere are the chromosomes. So if we zoom in on a chromosome, what we see is that they're made of, you know, these, these four molecules, G, A, T, and C, that are wound up like beads on a string. Uh, and those, those uh, beads are proteins. Well, the proteins are produced by the different genes in the genome. And the genes typically are, you know, there's lots of genes on an individual chromosome. And in humans, we've got about 20,000 genes. We've got 23 sets of chromosomes. Uh, if you do the math, it's somewhere around 900 genes per chromosome on average. And they produce all these proteins that do different things from, you know, helping carry oxygen around the body to, um, you know, the structural aspects of 
wrapping around to be compact on the chromosomes, um, wrapping the DNA around, they, uh, catalyzing reactions to speed them up, biochemical reactions. So um, this is just a, a bit of a refresher of the high school biology that most of you probably forgotten. So chromosome 14 in particular is about 100 million base pairs in length. So 100 million of those GATs and Cs all strung together. Um, and this is a, a map that was produced some uh, years ago, I think by the uh, National Institutes of Health um, that shows some of the genes that are on the 14th chromosome and include, you know, there's important genes, right? So there, there are genes that um, can lead to deafness or to things like ovarian cancer or diabetes. So lots of important stuff on the 14th chromosome. Okay, this is just a little bit of context. Most of you have probably seen this slide uh, either today or will again later in the meeting or have in previous meetings uh, because it's a, it's a good illustration of a ring chromosome. So uh, our chromosomes are typically linear, the straight molecules like you see on the left there. But in terms of ring formation, at some point, one of those linear chromosomes uh, typically has the ends broken off and then fuses together in a circle. And those ends are there thought, we're thought to mostly protect the DNA's integrity. There, uh, when I teach genetics to undergraduates, I talk about the aglets, right, on the end of your shoelaces, the little hard plastic things to keep them from coming unraveled. And that's what the, the ends of chromosomes have been compared to. So notice that when this uh, fusion event happens, that deleted genetic material can differ. Maybe it's just the very tips of the chromosome. Maybe it's a substantial part of the chromosome. And that's part of the variability that we see in ring chromosome conditions. And so those conditions include lots of different uh, uh, things like deletions, but also duplications. So that's where we have extra material. So we can have uh, a loss of material or addition of material where we've just simply like copied and pasted in a Word document and got extra material. And those uh, collectively are referred to as these copy number variants. So, right, a big part of this meeting has been devoted to the commission um, for CNVs, the copy number variants. And this is the kind of thing that they're talking about across uh, lots of different chromosomes. And so I've already mentioned that the Goldilocks number of chromosomes is 46. That's what most of us have. But there are conditions um, in humans like Turner syndrome where there's a loss of a chromosome. So Turner syndrome occurs in women, right? Because you can tell there's no Y chromosome. There's only an X. And so Turner's individuals have 45 chromosomes, not 46. And that presents some challenges with regards to the genes that are on the X chromosome and the dosage of those genes. So the, uh, the loss of genetic material can be problematic. So the Goldilocks number of genes, not the number of chromosomes, but the number of genes is somewhere around 20,000. And geneticists like to argue about this, just like artists talk about the number of different colors that are out there or Biologists talk about the number of mammalian species. It's, uh, it's hard to define a gene in some sense, but it's somewhere around 20,000. Uh, and what we know is that too many genes or too few genes can disrupt cellular processes and lead to serious medical conditions. Uh, and so these copy number variants are departures from the Goldilocks numbers. And we know that large copy number variants, whether we're talking about duplications, so in addition to that number 20,000, or deletion, subtraction of that number 20,000, um, the, the bigger the addition or subtraction is, the more those tend to be associated with neurodevelopmental disorders. And so this is just a cartoon that sort of shows uh, what one of the previous slides showed. These copy number variants can come in different flavors. So Turner syndrome illustrated how you can have the loss of a chromosome that leads to, um, you know, to medical problems, but so too can the addition. And probably the most familiar example is Down syndrome, which is an extra copy of chromosome 21. So now those individuals have 47 chromosomes in their cells, right? Not the Goldilocks, 46. So the addition of that extra 
causes dosage problems. So, right, I, the, the dosage you can't have too much, you can't have too little. So, the same sort of thing happens with trisomy 13 and extra copy. So, the broader point is that gene copy number is critical, right? You've got to have the right amount um, in the cells for the cells to function properly. And so, the loss of ring chromosomes is a real problem, not just for ring 14, but for some of the other ring syndromes. And I'll talk a little bit about that, but before I do, just a little uh, prelude to some of the things I'll talk about is that some of our children's cells uh, have only 45 chromosomes. So they have one normal linear chromosome, um, but they're missing the ring 14, which is lost during cell division. And that leaves them with a dosage problem, okay, called monosomy. So this thing that happens in real life in our children also is a problem in the lab, right? And has, uh, I think it's fair to say, has inhibited some of the research on ring chromosomes because it's hard to get these cells to grow in the laboratory. Um, and so that's something we'll come back to in a bit. But this idea of uh, two different lines of cells, those with the ring and those that have lost the ring uh, is seen with other conditions, not just ring 14, and we get this mosaicism um, and, uh, this mosaicism is, uh, you know, my, my daughter Marie in the back there has got about 85% of her cells have a linear, you know, chromosome 14 and the ring. So she's got both of those and most of them, but about 15% of her cells, she only has the one linear chromosome and the ring's been lost. And so that condition's called a monosome. Okay, and that causes some problems. Um, and we'll come back to that in a bit. So some of the problems associated with the ring, whether it's ring 14 or uh, you know, a, a different ring chromosome are associated with the cell cycle. And if you were in my genetics class, I might bore you with all the different aspects of the cell cycle, but I'm gonna spare you that today and hopefully show you a brief video um, that illustrates this idea of you know, DNA replication because our cells have to divide after the fun part of the sperm and the egg and the zygote happens, then that zygote's got to go from a single fertilized cell to a trillion cells or something like that, give or take a few billion in an adult human. All right, so that's a lot of cellular division that happens along the way. Sorry about that. And so if you could show that video, we'll see if we can make that work. It's only 15 or 20 seconds, so. Two daughter cells. Um, so maybe you can show that one more time. It's pretty quick. Okay, well, never mind. I've got another slide that, that I'll just skip to. So just go back. To Okay, um, so this is what that was trying to illustrate, right? On the left, if we're gonna divide a cell, the first thing we have to do is duplicate the, maybe not the first thing, one of the things we have to do is duplicate the genetic material, right? So that each of the daughter cells gets copies of the genetic material. And this happens again and again and again, right? It happens in our epidermal cells all the time, right? When we go out and get sunburned and our skin peels and we gotta regrow that skin, this is the process that happens, right? Um, and so we've duplicated that genetic material here and it's all lined up and organized nicely. And then these linear structures that kind of look like X's in that video separate to the two poles of the daughter cells that are produced. Right? So this is the way it's all supposed to work. It does work the vast majority of the time. It's actually pretty amazing when you think about all the cellular divisions that have to happen uh, you know, from a single fertilized egg. And here I am 52 years later standing up here, but you know, they say it's a trillion cells. I don't know if that's right, uh, but it's a lot. So the problem with ring chromosomes is that, uh, well, there's, there's a number of problems, including the fact that different kinds of structures are formed when that DNA is replicated. 
So it's not as simple as, and DNA replication is complicated anyway, right? We've got 3 billion nucleotides in the genome and the fidelity of the replication process is, is astounding, right? It's like 99.999% accurate. And to maintain that across all those cellular divisions is just amazing. So the fact that it works at all in the first place is, uh, is amazing. <clears throat> But when we introduce the circle, it introduces lots of problems, okay? And we can get different structures that form um, depending on lots of molecular details that I'm not gonna go into, but including things like this interlocked ring structure, right? So if you think about the DNA that's replicated like that, um, that's a real problem because here's, the, here's what's, this is actual, that was a cartoon, but here's the linear chromosome 14, here's a ring 14, um, same thing shown here in a cell, but that cell also has the duplicated material that actually is the interlocked rings. Well, those interlocked rings may line up there before uh, the genetic material migrates to the two daughter cells, but they can't migrate, right? It clogs up the works. And I think that's a big problem with ring chromosomes in general, uh, including ring 14. Okay. And this is a slide that, uh, that Dr. Tony Winshaw Boris, who's in the room here, for those of you on Zoom, uh, is the uh, head of genetics at the medical school at Case Western Reserve University. And hopefully I've already talked to, uh, to Tony to help back me up on this later. So if he has any additions uh, to anything I've said, or if you have any hard questions, I'm gonna shunt those off to Tony at the end. Um, but he shared the slide with me that illustrates the, the, some of the same sorts of problems that I'm not going to go into. What I do want to uh, emphasize is the ring instability. There's this constant production of chromosomal abnormalities from the ring itself. You know, rings of different size, uh, daughter cells that are produced without the ring, right, leading to these monosomic cell lines, uh, all sorts of things. And that cells with those kinds of abnormalities are less likely to survive. And the uh, persistent generation and elimination of these uh, abnormal cells at cell division implies a high cellular death rate and is likely to decrease the total number of viable cells. And I think that's probably true um, in a child with ring 14 and also in laboratory cells that um, you know, researchers are trying to propagate. So in the long run, these sorts of problems likely predispose children with ring chromosomes to growth deficiencies. And I think we see some of that in ring 14. But it's been proposed now, I guess, uh, I don't know, 20 or more years ago, that this ring syndrome transcends ring 14 to the other conditions. I don't think all the ring, all, all the chromosomes are not represented in um, rings, presumably because they're not all viable, but there are a half dozen or a dozen or so, I think, that are represented uh, in the scientific literature, and they all have some commonalities, including growth delays or failure to, uh, to thrive. Um, almost normal appearance, and I should make clear, right, I haven't done any research myself on like any of this stuff. This is just me parroting what I've read from the scientific literature. Uh, so almost uh, normal appearance, um, mild or moderate mental retardation. I think that's one that'll, that'll we'll come back to in a bit. So anyway, the, the point is that whether it's ring 14 or ring 17 or uh, ring 20, there's some similarities, okay? And those are referred to collectively as ring syndrome. Now in terms of ring 14, when you look at the generalities, you know, some of you have been to these meetings before where ring 14 and you've seen with your own eyes some of the similarities of our children, right? And of course, these are generalities. They don't apply in all the cases, but generally small, slow growth, small stature, developmental delays. Uh, many of our children have cognitive deficits and limited spoken language capacity. Um, one of the things we often see is epilepsy, seizures, and uh, unfortunately, those seizures are often intractable and can't be controlled well. Um, and so, you know, preaching to the choir to tell you that these can, this can lead to other problems, you know, be it 
you know, constipation or the need for feeding tubes or anything else, right? The seizures cause a, a heck of a lot of problems. And you all know too, the ring 14 is really, really rare. So among the 173 things that, that uh, my lovely wife asked me to talk about are genotype phenotype associations. And so to talk about that, I wanna just try and make sure that everybody can, you know, remember through the dim fog of high school biology, you know, the genotypes is a set of hereditary blueprints of an individual and the phenotype is the observed set of characteristics. So right here, here we've got a, a marine um, bivalve, a mollusk, and you could see some of the phenotypic variability in these things. Uh, Mendel, the Austrian monk <clears throat> in the 1860s or so, recognized that some of the phenotypic variability in pea plant flower color uh, could be attributed to the genotype. And he did this through all these, uh, you know, these breeding experiments and the fun Punnett squares that y'all learned about at one point. Okay, so this slide or this figure here really illustrates <clears throat> the phenotype and the flower color and the genotype in the Punnett square. And that's nice in theory. Uh, it's most traits are more complicated than that. You know, if we're talking about um, complex traits like skin coloration or human height or eye pigmentation or lots of these things, there's lots of variability out there in the world and we can model this. In this case, modeling it with three different genes, the A gene, the B gene and the C gene, but exactly in the same way with the Punnett square. And I'm not gonna make you go through this big Punnett square, but you get the idea that uh, you know, if we have a variable population, some individuals, uh, you know, have um, zero copies of, you know, in this case, pigmentation alleles at these loci, some have lots. And what we see is that there's a heck of a lot of variability in this, you know, in this hypothetical experiment. And it comes out then into statistics. So not only are, is, uh, is genetics involved, but statistics, you remember from high school wondering about the class average on the test, right? And the statistical distribution. And so a lot of genetics and these genotype phenotype associations rely on genetic correlations um, that show here that like these would be the different phenotypes, right? Phenotype one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that all have to do with pigmentation from light to dark, you know, of eye color, skin color, whatever the case may be. And that we see that those of intermediate shades, you know, there's lots of assumptions behind these models, but in general, those are going to be more common than the two extremes. And so this just is trying to make the point that complex traits, whether it's intelligence or human height or anything else, are generally encoded by lots and lots of genes. It's not a single gene or two. And so when you think about those 900 odd genes on chromosome 14, some of those may interact with each other, but they're also interacting with genes on the other chromosomes as well. So there's a lot happening. So um, one of the things about these copy number variants, whether we're talking about duplications or deletions, is that they're, they're, we're not talking about one or two genes, but lots of genes, because the gene density is generally pretty high with respect to the size of these deletions. On average in the ring 14 kids, the deletions are about uh, a million and 800,000 base pairs. Right? So some bigger, some smaller, but you know, it's a significant piece of DNA that spans generally several genes. And so there's a, there's a number of things about our kids that, uh, that make it tough to think about. I've had people ask me about some of the technologies like CRISPR, you know, emerging genetic technologies for gene editing, and would that be applicable you know, family members have asked me about it. And, you know, I, I, I think in the short term, no, it's not obvious to me how that's applicable, but maybe in the longer term, you know, there's all, I mean, 10 years ago, nobody knew anything about CRISPR gene editing. Right? And today it's real and there's a, there's a lot happening there. So I think the point is that with research, you know, unexpected outcomes are almost to be expected. I, we get lots of uh, progress in areas where we don't necessarily see it happening, 
So just because I don't see a, a, you know, an immediate fix for ring 14 you know, in the next year or two doesn't mean that something like that's not gonna emerge. And I would say that you know, Dr. Winshaw Boris has done some work on, who's also on the, the ring 14 scientific advisory board, has done some work on ring chromosomes and you know, trying to, um, you know, to replace uh, defective chromosome in a cell, if you wanna think about it that way. And I think has made some progress in that regard. So who knows what the future holds and whether, you know, chromosome therapy for conditions like ring 14 will become viable or not. I'm, I'm, I would almost bet that they're gonna become viable. Is it gonna be viable in time to help uh, Marie, my 16 year old? Yeah, that's questionable. But the next generation of ring 14 kids, yeah, I think uh, there's, a, there's a good chance that their future could be positively impacted by some of the research that's happening today. Okay, so how am I doing on time? What, what time is it? Fifteen minutes left. Okay, all right. I'm sure that thrills everybody. <laughs> um, okay, I think I'm about two thirds done. So I'll hopefully, if the math works out. Um, so, you know, Mendel showed that in theory, a single gene could control flower color, right? And worked out the patterns of inheritance and how all that works. Uh, in practice, we don't want to know that there's a single, you know, uh, abstract aspect to uh, our kids' genomes that makes their condition. We want to know the details and work it out. And so does everybody else's, you know, that these other groups and the other breakout rooms are the same kind of thing. We want to know all these kinds of details. And in many of those cases, genotype phenotype studies can help pinpoint the role of genes. And so uh, I'm gonna try and, and walk you through this. I don't know if this is a good idea on my part or not, but I'm gonna try. So imagine these different cohorts of plants. So we've got four plants in this cohort, four plants in this cohort, four in this one and so on. All right? In the first cohort, they're all green. The last cohort, they're all brown. In a couple, they're mixed. Uh, and we're trying to figure out the genetic basis. And we can see the chromosomal variation. So the DNA sequence variation, you know, in all our plants, it, but it's big, right? We got lots and lots of nucleotides to consider. And if we're trying to figure out which nucleotide is affecting this phenotype, if any, how are we gonna do that? There's 3 billion of them. So you could imagine in theory going through them one by one. So let's look at this. So if we look at this first sequence, so all these, uh, cohort have this DNA sequence. And if we look at this first position, we're wondering, hmm, could this A nucleotide impact the color? Well, they're, they all have an A and they're all green. So maybe, what about the next one? Yep, got an A, they're all green. The next one got an A, they're all green. The next one, they have a C. Well, one green one, three brown ones. Yeah, that kind of, that doesn't work perfectly with our model our model being that this nucleotide position determines this phenotype. We can go to this one. Now we've got the A again. So if, they, if we're right, they should all be green, but they're not. All right. In the last one, we got an A and they, they're all brown there. So that's not a great association between the genotype and the phenotype at that site. We could do the same thing at the next site, right? And the next one, and the last one, and I'll spare you the details, but just like the first one, they don't, there's not a strong association. But the one in the box, what we see is that A, green, okay, A, green, A, green, we're looking pretty good. G, brown, uh, except for this one. So we're 75% brown, 25% green. The next one, we get the same sort of pattern, 75% brown. And the last one, we're all brown. So this is not a perfect association but it shows that there is a better than random chance across all these nucleotide positions in the genome that that nucleotide position is associated with that phenotype. So it's not a direct one-to-one, -one, but it's pretty close. It's a, there's a statistical association there. Okay, well, we don't care about flower color, right? Or the plant color, but we care about our kids. And so you could imagine um, cases, right? So cases where we've got kids with uh, a rare genetic disorder, 
controls being just a random draw of kids from the population and then trying to compare those and doing the same kind of thing. And so maybe we want to, uh, so let's say we're trying to find a gene for height. So we take kids and assay them at six years old and our control group is just random draw of all the six year olds and their height. And we, you know, we plot those out and then we look across the genome and we compare those to our cases of kids that are really tall at six years old. And then we look across the genome and sort of do the scan where each color represents a different chromosome. And we see that there are a few chromosomes, this purple one here, this purple one, the black one, and especially the blue one on the end, where there's some real statistical outliers that associate with uh, uh, that, that are correlated with the genotype and phenotype. So this is the idea behind genotype, phenotype studies. The details vary from study to study. Uh, and that's not exactly how it's worked with the ring 14 genotype, phenotype studies, but it's the, the principles are the same. So here, uh, this was the first paper that I know of that's, that's really tried to tackle this with ring 14 specifically. And so this left panel sort of shows the genotypes that were observed in a small study, right? 25 or 27 patients, something like that. Uh, and the right shows some of the phenotypes. And I'll note that patient 17 looks especially cute there. So uh, this is some of the work that I think Ring 14 International sponsored years ago. Uh, by Giovanni Neri's group in Italy. And so, um, you know, some of you were involved in that. So the Italian group went through and through these genotype phenotype associations and th their, their sample sizes are so small. This paper actually has no statistical analyses in it at all. And so it's a, it's a little bit loosey goosey, I think, but what they found in general, th these are the data on ring 14. So the two pluses mean that most of the, most or all the patients had seizures, um, MRs, you know, intellectual impairment, visual impairment, behavioral disorders, scoliosis, um, you know, small heads, the kinds of things that, that you've all seen and know about. They also look at some deletions, you know, just deletions on chromosome 14 and there's a lot of similarities between the two, but it's not a perfect overlap between the, the genotypes and the phenotypes. Okay. One of the other things they were able to do is, of course, I already showed you a map that showed all the genes on chromosome 14, and they know where some of these deletions occurred, and they know the genes that are in those regions, and were able, through this kind of association approach, to suggests that there are genes responsible for epilepsy, um, you know, up, up here in sort of the middle part of the chromosome. And there are genes responsible for scoliosis, um, infectious susceptibility, uh, you know, uh, in cognitive deficits and so forth near the end of the chromosome. Okay. Well, they extended this study a few years later to show that, um, you know, if you remember earlier, I talked about my daughter has these two cell lines um, and it turns out out of their 25 or 27 kids that they surveyed the second time around, these, almost everybody has the same thing. 82% of the cells look like this. So they got two chromosomes, one linear, one ring and about 18% are monosomic. So just the linear, no ring. So there's an immediate dosage problem going on here that's causing issues for sure. Uh, and I've been struck by the lack of variability in this, that 18%, uh, 20%, 20%, 17%, 19%, 18%. 18%. So that suggests to me that there's some sort of threshold that, um, you know, that is required to, um, yeah, just, a, I, I'll leave it at that, just a threshold effect. So, uh, and this also gives you some idea of the deletions in megabases. A megabases is a million nucleotides of DNA. So right here, this is 650,000 nucleotides that are missing in that patient. Right? Uh, this is a million 400,000 nucleotides that are missing. 
So um, it seems to me in my interpretation of their data that the ring 14 phenotypes are pretty similar with or without deletions in the ring. And so it's not exactly clear whether those deletions are copy number variants or what's driving this or whether it's the structural effects of the chromosome itself, the ring itself. I tend to think the latter, but I'm not sure they would agree with me. Um, and so you can go down this and look at uh, uh, sort of the genotypes are up here on the top and the phenotypes are down here. And if you go across these, you know, if you have uh, ring, there's, there's some real similarities and there's some real differences. You know, if we, get, if we talk about things like hypotonia, right? Most of you have been told that your kids have got low muscle tone. Well, that occurs at, at very similar frequencies in those individuals with ring 14 and those with um, just linear deletions. There are several of these sorts of traits that are pretty similar, but there are also some that are quite different. So I don't really know what to make of this other than, than um, the sample sizes are small. And I'll come back to that in a minute. One other study that I want to mention is this Specchio uh, et al. And I don't recognize any of these names. Um, so I, I don't know any of these folks. Um, but they had a paper in the journal Epilepsy and Behavior a few years ago. And I've gone through this and, you know, I, I'm no neurologist. Uh, I've looked at these EEGs, you know, that we've had on my daughter, but that are still tend to be printed out on paper. I think that's changing depending on where you are at what hospital. Now they're becoming more electronic, which I think would be a good thing, you know, for, you know, these phenotype, genotype association studies. But about all I could make out of this is that uh, most of the ring 14 kids that have seizures have generalized tonic clonic seizures and that there's a real lack of EEG data. Uh, and I'm not even sure how uh, folks smarter than me, I'm sure could, uh, they probably have given some thought into how to categorize EEG data into phenotypes um, and then associate that with genotypes, you know, depending on whether you have these temporal lobe spikes or whatever the case may be. I think that's, this is not at all clear in my head after reading this paper, what the take home message is you know, other than our kids have generalized tonic-clonic seizures. So that, make of that what you will. I do want to foreshadow a bit. I think our next speaker uh, just published a paper in the journal Epilepsia uh, that's sort of hot off the press. And so I don't want to steal any thunder there, but um, stay tuned uh, and, uh, and we'll see where, where that goes. So Back to the, the sample sizes in ring 14, the studies that have been done, these genotype phenotype association studies, the sample sizes are really small. And I work on endangered species. Right? Our sample sizes are always small. So I'm kind of sympathetic from the scientist perspective. On the other hand, um, I think that I'll just take this opportunity to encourage the ring 14 families in this room and out there on Zoom to really consider participating in research studies. Uh, I don't know that there's a, you know, a silver bullet that's gonna come out of a research study in the next six months, but I do think they're absolutely the building blocks that are required for science to move forward, for therapies to eventually happen. And so there you go. I'll encourage you to, uh, to think about participating in those kinds of studies. And, Unfortunately, I don't have any brilliant, I'll never have brilliant thoughts, but, you know, especially with regards to ring 14. Um, you know, about all I can say is that when I think about this cancer, you know, we now know is generally caused by genetic variants. Uh, and cancer patients, right, if you go to a cancer hospital, there's lots of different underlying genotypes. And I think if ring 14 syndrome exists, as, as uh, you know, this Neary's group has argued, I'm not exactly sure it's any different from the generic ring syndrome that's been described, but uh, either way, I think there's lots of genetic variants within the ring 14 community. So not all our kids, yeah, they may, even the ones that have ring 14, uh, there's a lot of variability within that category. And I think that's gotta be appreciated. Uh, and I think the role of copy number variants is, is yet to be firmly established. Uh, it may be really important, it may not be, but that's why research is required. And so I'm, I'm very supportive of the role of the commission 
um, on the CMVs. So hopefully, as I mentioned, I think, you know, the, the electronic world has some real advantages and I hope it's gonna help tie together the sort of epilepsy studies and genetic studies a little more effectively than they have been in the past. And I will say that I think single cell genomics where we're looking at the genomes of individual cells uh, could be really informative because most of the studies that have been done so far have been done on you know, blood cells or you know, epidermal cells. And I, you know, how do those compare to what's going on in other tissues in the body? Right? A lot of our kids have digestive problems. What's going on in, in you know, cells in uh, the GI tract? especially the neurology, right? what's going on with those cells. And so um, I'm not gonna say anything more about it. It's tough for me to even think about, but I know the scientific advisory committee is, uh, has discussed in the past post-mortem studies, you know, and try to be opportunistic and make the best of a bad situation to, uh, to you know, potentially collect cells that could help inform the next generation of ring 14 patients. And I think that's something I would encourage families to consider as well. So the, the whole ring 14 research uh, apparatus is uh, prepared, I think, to, to talk about that some. And I think I'll leave it at that. Um, and be, if I left any time, I'll be happy to try and answer any questions or not, whatever my wife tells me. So I'm, it's my understanding our next speaker is recorded. And so we can take a little bit of time for questions. And so when we ask questions, you can ask them from, from the app, okay? If you are on Zoom, if you have any questions about any of this, you can use the Q&A in the app. But for us in the room, we could just ask questions. And when we do that, uh, certainly Andrew is fair game. I'm putting his head on the chopping block, but also, uh, Dr. Tony Weintraub Forrest has offered from our SAD has off has off what am I trying to say has also offered. there we go he's also said that he will answer questions so anyway sorry about that um, so with that does anybody have questions yeah okay yeah. Let, let me get you a mic. Do we have a mic? Because they can't hear you. Um, when Mateus <laughs> was diagnosed, um, we were told that what was missing in his chromosome was um, the P-arm. And at the time, the way the geneticist explained it was, well, the P-arm really isn't genetically important, but when I listen to you explain it, um, it sounds really important. <laughs> so um, is it important, like if just small portions of um, the chromosome break off, would that still significantly have impacted him, even if it wouldn't have formed into a ring? Like. Yeah, I'll first off give my caveat that, right, I'm not a physician, I'm not a human geneticist, uh, but I have looked at that, including last week, uh, I looked at like the, the actual sequence of the 14th chromosome, and it's true, there's that P, uh, the P arm stands for the petite or short arm of the chromosome, so, right, the P arm's always the small one, and it's really small in chromosome 14, but that said, there are a number of genes that, right, presumably are important on the P arm. Now, relative to the Q arm, there's a, a very small number of genes, but there are functional genes there, both protein coding genes and these long non coding RNAs whose function is, I think, uh, not perfectly clear. Um, so I, I think the answer is uh, we don't really know. So I, I'm happy for Tony to jump in there if you want to get the mic, Tony. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So the P arm of some of these chromosomes, when they're very, very small, they do contain a lot of genes, but they it turns out that they're repetitive genes 
that mostly code that mostly make proteins that are important for how proteins get made. So there's a it really doesn't matter, but there's a lot of them on those P arms, and many people have different amounts. Hmm? Okay. No, most people, most people, there's some can be some variable size, so you don't need 100% of those genes, and they're on some of the other smaller arms as well. But that being said, we don't really know much about that region, those regions, because they've been very, very difficult to sequence, and only recently have people been able to figure out how to sequence them? And that's only been coming out lately. So I guess one answer would be um, that the genes may or may not be important. So there's nothing, you, you're certainly, it's possible. Another possibility is those regions, since they have all these repeats when they form a ring, could do something to turn off or on other genes on chromosome 14. And we just don't understand that very well. Because certainly when you put, the, the, some genes in the wrong positions, they don't act normally. So, so you can imagine a ring might do that. But, but again, I think it's not so well understood, but there aren't the genes that are there are sort of compensated for by some other genes. And so we don't really know what the effect would be of missing, you know, a whole PRM of one of these chromosomes. So if I'm understanding this right, with any of the different ring chromosome syndromes, there's so much overlap in the, the symptoms from them. Um, but if you were just talking about it being caused by like the breakage or the unions on each of you know, those and what genes are on that chromosome, then that wouldn't explain what that convergence is across ring chromosomes. Is that the right way to look at that? Do, do, do I need to explain that in the? Yeah, so, you know, like ring 14 and ring 20 and, um, you know, others, they, they all have um, epilepsy and, um, the, you know, small head size. And, you know, there's all these commonalities, which, you know, kind of tells me that it's not being caused specific on that chromosome because there's so much overlap you know, in, the, in the symptom. So there must be something else or are genes repeated on different chromosomes or I mean, could there be other explanations for that? I'll just say I tend to agree with you, right? I think that there's probably something to the idea that these ring chromosomes really um, impede mitosis, cell division, and that cascades into a host of problems irrespective of what genes are on the chromosome. Mm -hmm. Now that's not to say that it would explain all the variation of phenotypes, but I think that's probably a big part of it, but that's my take. Tony certainly knows more about it than me. So the ring syndrome is, uh, what that sort of refers to is that the ring itself causes problems irrespective of how many genes are deleted. And that's that, that ring syndrome is, uh, and Andrew said it very well, small, smaller size, some intellectual disability, some other sort of aspects. But some chromosomes, if you delete particular genes, it causes a different syndrome. It causes something that's due to the loss of those genes. So I guess the, the answer would be that some chromosomes, some ring patients might have a predominantly a ring syndrome and others might have a ring syndrome plus whatever they've lost. And others, if the genes they lost are so important, they don't even, you don't even know they have a ring chromosome, but you know they have that, that syndrome, that, if that makes sense. Um, a brief comment to that. So um, I think this is where the commission is super important. Oh, yeah. So, hi, I, I'm Dennis. I'm working at the Cleveland Clinic. I'm specialized on genetics and um, of many neurodevelopmental disorders. 
and um, do like from genetics to clinical type of research. So, um, yeah, I think um, this is where the commission really um, kicks in and that's why everyone um, needs to participate because um, these kind of phenotypes having a bigger head or a smaller head or seizures and um, cognitive problems, they're, they're super unspecific. Um, you know, you have that with many, many, many different um, uh, just, um, genes and CNVs, and there can be hundreds of different pathways going on and off, which can lead to these clinically similar looking, um, you know, representations. So because I think we are still in Stone Age in terms of clinical assessment, what the underlying biology is in terms of what is the, you know, how the, these things are connected. And with a framework like the commission where we you know collect a lot of um, data from individual um, families and um, individuals we then can truly statistically say hey this is really ring 14 for example because this is you know for example something which is this or maybe this combination of by a certain age age this is something what you don't see with the others and um, as long as we don't really can tell this um it's um, more like um, intuition and which can be good, but can also frequently, you know, be um, a little bit biased, especially if you have data, which comes from many, many sites, many people have collected it. And that um, limits um, us as scientists to um, develop good hypotheses. And we need really good hypotheses um, to um, go towards drug development. Can I just follow that up with one other quick thing? So is there, does there tend to be more severity then with like more loss of, or like more rings or more loss, or is that still kind of undecided too? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understood some more rings, more loss, meaning. Um, um, if, if there's more, a, a higher percentage of ring chromosomes, a higher percentage of missing, um, you know, Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I have a good answer for that. So I'll, I don't I'll have a, I don't have a certain answer, but um, I think what you're what you're getting at is the proportion of cells in an individual that have a ring, or in the case of what Andrew was saying about Marie, where she has monosomy, and what effect might that have? And uh, so you know the real answer is we don't know, but one would have to think that that is important. And the only thing that we know about for Marie, and I think, although we might know her skin as well, is what her proportion of cells are in those two tissues. We have no idea what the proportion of cells are in her brain, in her heart, in her liver. I think uh, that, you know, and instead of great, we need to have more people participating so we can hopefully find some of the answers to these questions, because at the moment, they're just unknown. And we don't even really have any ways of doing these sorts of studies in tissue culture, though we're trying for animal models because all the animal models have these short tips of the chromosomes that are hard to study. So animal, like it was like your question. It's a very difficult thing to even do it in animal models, so. We had one online question and I wanna make sure that that's, uh addressed. So Rohini has asked, so how often should we do genetic testing to know the percentage of ring chromosomes lost? So do we need to do repeat genetic re testing? Yeah, okay. So you read that a little bit differently than I did. So repeat tests. So like, should we have Marie tested again uh, to see if her proportions of cells have changed. I'm inclined to say no, not from blood tissue again, mostly because all the kids look very similar, right? Um, and so that tells me, irrespective of age or anything like that. So I don't think that it needs to be redone. I uh, also don't know if you haven't had your kid tested uh, that that's going to have any, you know, clinical value, but I do think it adds to research value. Okay, I know we're... Uh, yeah, I was going to 